Matthew chapter 27. If you would please stand in honor of God's word as we read the word of God. Matthew chapter 27. We'll begin reading in verse 50. The Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. When Christ was born into this world as a man, his birth was accompanied with many miracles. Besides the fact that he was born from a virgin's womb, there are other notable miracles concerning his birth. There was the angel that visited the shepherds. There was the heavenly host that was praising God. There was a star in the sky that guided the wise man to where Jesus was located. Christ was not born just like any other man because he is not just any other man. His birth was special. It was a miraculous birth. But just like Jesus' birth was accompanied by miracles, so was his death accompanied with miracles. Many men died of crucifixion, but no man died like this man, Jesus. Jesus, he didn't die like any other man because, again, he's not just any other man. It's only fitting that because he was born with miracles that he should leave this world or, or uh, he should die with miracles accompanying him and the supernatural there. Our text today tells us about four notable miracles that happened when Christ was crucified. The veil of the temple was rent, the earth did quake, the rocks rent, and the graves were open. My focus today, though, is on the temple veil. And the title of my message this morning is The Miracle of the Rending of the Temple Veil. Notice in verse 51, it says, And behold. It says, Behold. Now that word means uh, to fix the eyes upon, to see with attention, or to observe with care. And so I believe that God wants us to consider the miracle of the rending of the temple veil and what significance it has for us today. It tells us some very important things about our relationship to God. It tells us some things that have ended, and it also tells us about some things that have started. And so we're going to look at that. So, first of all, we see that the ringing of the temple bell tells us some things that have ended. And in under this, we see that there's no more separation. You see, there was a separation in the Old Testament. God couldn't be approached on, uh, by, by people. In fact, if you look at times when... When God approached people and spoke to them personally several times in the Bible, they felt like they were going to die because they saw God face to face. Amen. And so there was a separation. And uh, But now this veil, this veil in the temple was for separation. Now, in the temple, let me just lay it out for you a little bit. They... There's several courts. We're not going to get into all that, but there's an outer court where they, they did uh, the sacrifices and things like that. And, and, and then uh, as they moved inside uh, the temple, the building there, as they moved inside, they would find the holy place. And inside that holy place, they, they had a candlestick and a table of showbread and an altar of incense. Now, each piece of furniture that's associated with a, uh, with a temple and a tabernacle was to point to uh, something about Christ and what he had done for us. But as you uh, go from the holy place uh, beyond the temple, you would go into the holy of holies. And beyond 
and, and inside that holy of holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of that was the mercy seat. And that's where the priest would come and he would sprinkle blood on that mercy seat. And God would come down in, in what was called the Shekinah glory of God. And he would come down and he would accept that blood sacrifice. But there was nobody allowed in that holy, in that holy of holies except for one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And that's where the presence of God came down and everybody had to stand outside the temple to, to uh, see from the priest if their offering had been accepted by God. And so they were separated. Okay? But this veil that has been rent from top to bottom opens the way into the holy place. Amen. I can imagine in my mind's eye, I don't know if it happened this way, but I can imagine in my mind's eye that, that those priests, you know, when Christ died, he died and on the day of when the Passover was, was given. He died. He is our Passover lamb. He is our sacrifice. He made the atonement on that day. Now, uh, when the, I can just imagine that as the priest uh, is probably going in to, to offer that sacrifice and that veil is rent from top to bottom. Can you imagine how they were like, uh, how the priest might have been like, what? I'm not supposed to see this. Even though he was in there, he was supposed to, that he was supposed to fill that place with incense so he couldn't really see what was going on. So here's the thing. Jesus Christ rent that thing from top to bottom. Now this wasn't just an ordinary veil. This, or just an ordinary curtain. It's not just an ordinary curtain. This thing was thick. It was thick and it was heavy. And he rent that thing from top to bottom. Listen, this is a notable miracle. And what Jesus Christ, or what God is saying through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is, he said, I'm open the way for you to come into me and receive me. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, specifically in that text, that middle wall of partition is talking about the outer court. If you go further out of the temple, there was a court of the Gentiles. And then there was a middle wall of partition that would uh, keep the Gentiles, they couldn't go in any further. In fact, they placed rocks up against that, that wall and they put it on there in the Greek that if any Gentile goes beyond that, then they would die. Okay? But what Christ is saying is, hey, we're all made nigh. We're all the same. Amen. Hey, if you're in Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, we're all in the church of God. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. We've been allowed in. Hey, the Bible tells us we were outcasts. We were alienated. We were away from God. We're dead in sins and trespasses. But since he saved us and he made that sacrifice on the cross for our sins, he said, hey, he definitely calls us beloved, adopted. Hey, and the list goes on and on. We're, we're righteous in him. Thank God we have access to God. Amen. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I told that, uh, that man, that Catholic this week, I told him, I, I asked him, I said, do you need the priest to, be, to go to heaven? And he was telling me that he needed him to, he confesses his sins to him. I said, you know what? God has made us kings and priests unto him. And we don't need to bow to priests and tell them our sins. We can go directly to the one in charge. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. I don't have to sit in a cubby hall and tell somebody my sin. I can go directly to God. Amen. Amen. Now, I know I'm not much to look at, but as far as God's concerned, I'm a king and a priest in his eyes. Amen. Thank God. Amen. I'm getting excited by the fact that I can come right to him. I don't need a light of candle. I don't need to pray to Mary. Hey, I, I, know, I know I get off on this a lot, but listen, I'm thankful that I have access to God the Father. Amen. Amen. But Brother John, the one who created everything that we see, I can talk to him. I know him today. I know him. Why? He's in my heart. He's all around, but I can pound, I can pray to him. I love him today. Amen. Thank God there's no separation.
restoration. And I want to ask you this before I move on. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know him like I do? Listen, if you don't, you can. You can come to him and you can accept him as your Savior. You can know him. Thank God for that. We have access to God. But there's no more, there's not just no more separation. There's also no more sacrifice. You see, the priests had to offer a sacrifice first for themselves because they were sinners. And then they had to offer a sacrifice for the people. And the priests, they only offered sacrifices. They didn't give themselves. You know what? They were chosen. They, they didn't give themselves to the priesthood. God said, this is what you're going to do. He gave them, he, he told them, this is, this is what you're going to do. He laid it out for them, and he said, you know, the next in line, the next in line. That, I mean, when a Levite was born, and he come to an understanding of what he was going to do, he, he eventually understood that he was going to serve the Lord by giving a sacrifice. He didn't have a choice. But you know what? Jesus Christ had a choice, didn't he? He's our high priest, but he chose. He chose to die. He offered Himself, Hebrews 9, 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. See, the priests, they would go in there every year, year after year, offer that sacrifice. But not this man. He came once into the holy place and he said, It is finished. Amen. Praise God for that. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Listen, this is why you can't get saved over and over, amen? Because there's one sacrifice for sin. This is why you can't work your way to heaven. Because Jesus Christ died for your sin to get you to heaven. Listen, it's an insult to God to say that if my good works outweigh my bad works, then I'm okay to go to heaven. Why? Because he gave the very best that heaven could ever offer for you, for your sins to get you to heaven. Amen. Hey, thank God for that. Listen, you can't work it. You can't work it. It'll never add up. We can't lose our salvation. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for it. And if we accept that, he gives us eternal life. And I just ask you, how long is eternal life? It's eternal. It's just a never ending, amen. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 12 says this. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. One sacrifice he made. And that, amen, that, that took care of it all. Amen. Y'all pray for me. I still got some more to preach. Amen. <laughs> but then there's, there's no more priestly service. No more priestly service. The priest represented man to God. In the ringing of the temple, Bell said, I like this. When God ran that bell down, he said, we don't need you anymore, priest. <laughs> How do you like that? Amen. And here the Catholics are keep trying to carry that on. He said, we don't need a priest anymore. I'm just going to make them all priests, amen? And they can come to me anytime they want to. By the way, that is a distinctive of what the Baptists believe, that we are priests in our own right, we, and we call it the priesthood of the believer, that we can come directly to God. Amen. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Hebrews 7, verses 24 through 26. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make an intercession for them. For such an high priest became of us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. But then in Revelation 1.6, so he's the high priest, right? There were many priests, but there was also a high priest. So Jesus Christ is the high priest, but he's made us. I'm talking about those of us who know him as our Lord and Savior. He is, we are priests of the him. 
In Revelation 1, 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. You know, John even, John even said, Hey, praise God for that. We're made uh, kings and priests. And we can go to God through him. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Hey, he is the man. Amen. He's the man. Praise God for that. So the reading of the temple veil tells us about some things that have ended. Amen. No more separation. No more uh, sacrifice. And no more priestly service. But the reading of the temple veil tells us about three things that have started. And we see this. Uh, we see, first of all, a personal dwelling. A personal dwelling. You see, in the temple, I, I just shared this with you, in the temple... God would manifest his presence there in the Holy of Holies. And again, everything in that temple was the point to what Jesus Christ has done for our sins. Now that work is completed, there's no more need for the temple. Today, believers are the temple of God. Don't you like that? I, I mean, I like how all that stuff points to Jesus Christ. And it's a great study. You study the tabernacle, you study the temple. That's a great study on how it's a type of Christ and things like that. But listen, I'm glad we don't have to use it anymore. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll study it. I'm thankful for it. But listen, I'm glad we don't have to use it anyway. He did away with it, and he made us the temple. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye, are, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Listen, folks. We, we're not our own. We don't belong to ourselves. Just, just like the priest would never take anything that was unconsecrated into that temple and defile it, that just like that, we are not to take anything in, in our bodies and defile it. We are to stay clean and holy before God. Why? Because we are his temple and the Holy Spirit of God is abiding inside of us. And so we are to keep ourselves clean. Now, you know, some people say, well, what's the matter with this? What's the matter with that? Well, I mean, th there may be sometimes it's not completely spelled out in Scripture. But the thing is, is we are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, and we are to try to remain as pure and holy as we can. Amen. That's why Jesus, that's what God said in 1 Peter 1. He said, be holy. Why? Because I'm holy. God, God wants to abide in a holy vessel. Turn over, if you would, please, to John chapter 14. Why are you doing that? I'll take a break. <laughs> John chapter 14, beginning in verse 16. He said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. You see, Jesus Christ was with them, and he comforted them. He, he actually started off in John chapter, in, uh, John chapter 14, verse 1. He said, uh, you know, uh, 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 let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He was comforting them at that time. He was telling them, hey, I'm fixing to leave you. Okay? And so he was being a comfort, but he said, and he said, You I shall give you another comforter that may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit of God coming to live inside of him. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while. The world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. I think what these are some of the sweetest words you can read in the Bible. These are, I mean, just to see that God sent His, his uh, sent the Holy Spirit to come and abide with us. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, 
and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, God has a, a, a he is indwelling us. I'm talking about those of us who are saved now, who know him as Savior. He indwells us. But you know what? It's, it's imperative that we live our lives to point others to Christ. Amen. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Hold your place here in, in John, because we'll look in John just a minute. But uh, look in, in Matthew uh, chapter 5. Verse 13, Matthew 5, 13. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus said that, hey, I'm dwelling in you, but hey, you're the salt of the earth, and your life is to point others to Christ. John 17, let's look at there. I told you, hold your place there in John. Let's look over at John 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hey, here's another one of these verses that help us out in the gray area. Why? Because you may not see anything necessarily against it from the Bible, but we can also see that the Bible says, keep them from the evil that is in this world, and we're to be not of this world, because Jesus Christ is not of this world. In John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. First John chapter 3, verse 13, God said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Listen, we're not, it's not our job to fit into this world. It's not our job to partake of the things that this world has to offer. We are to separate ourselves because the Holy Ghost of God is abiding inside of us. We are His temple. We're to keep ourselves clean and to point others to, to the Savior. Now listen, just like that temple had everything in it to point to the Savior, and people knew, people knew they might not have gone in that temple, but listen, people knew that that's where if a man wanted to find God have anything to do with him, he'd go to that temple. But what I want to ask you this. If you're the temple of God, do people know that they can come to you for help if they need something from God? Do they? Does your work, does people you work with, do they know you're a Christian? Do you act like it? Do you talk like it? Uh, an old preacher one time said, he said, hey man, act, act right, talk right, and spit right. Amen. <laughs> listen, listen, everything about us ought to point to the Lord and Savior Jesus Amen. Christ. But then we see what else has started is a personal relationship. This goes along with the Word of God and prayer. I'm running out of time, but we're not going to take a look at it. But Psalm 63, why don't you write that down? Why don't you read it sometime? David, he said, Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longed for thee in the dry, thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I've seen in the sanctuary, David longed after a relationship with God. Now, surely, uh, men in the Bible, in the Old Testament times, had a relationship with God. We can't deny that. But the thing is, is after Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin, and he said, it is finished, there is now a more intimate relationship that we can have with God than, than the men in the Old Testament 
ever know about. Amen. Our relationship with God has a deeper meaning than it did back then. Hebrews, verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness, oh, excuse me, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. He says this, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's why our relationship with Jesus Christ is so important. That's why we must fellowship with him. It's because he died, he died for us. Listen, do you realize that Jesus Christ, now, I'm sure you know this because I've said it, you know, Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross. But he didn't just do that just to save you from your sin. I'm, I'm thankful that he did. But you know what? He died. So you and I can have an intimate relationship with him. So that we can know him. So that we can fellowship with him. Through the word of God and prayer. He died for that relationship, folks. That's why it's so important. And you may say, you may say it like, hey, pastor sounds like a broken record. And then some of you people are like, what's a record? And you know, some of the kids are like, what's a record? <laughs> I guess sometimes, you know, even our, our sayings get out of, uh, you know, get old, don't they? But listen, I'm not just repeating myself for no reason at all. Jesus Christ died for you to have a relationship with him. Yes. But then, uh, last, the thing that uh, has begun is, you know, at the ending, uh, the things that have ended was there's no more sacrifice. That's one of the things that have ended. But one of the things that has started is a personal sacrifice. You see, when that when, when he went to that temple, there's no more sacrifice for the priest, right? But and now we're all priests, and what do we do? We are called to a life of service for the Lord Jesus Christ. Before the temple veil was rent, God required a dead sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. But now God wants a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So Christ has made the ultimate sacrifice by giving his life for you. Now God tells us that because of the mercies of God that has been shown you, it's reasonable that you should give yourself personally to God. I want to ask you this. Is there anything that you would hold back from God? Is there anything that you hold back from Him? You see, He wants us to give our lives as a sacrifice. You know, sometimes when we talk about uh, giving God things, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll say this. We'll say, hey, hey, Fernando, we'll say this. We'll say, hey, hey, God, I want you to have this. Go ahead and take it. Go, go ahead and take it. No, go ahead, God. Go ahead and take it. Go ahead, God. God, I want you to have this. And that's the way we live. We, we hold on to stuff. But God wants us to do this and say, Lord, I want you to take this. You see, we need to live a life of open hands unto God. A life that we're just willing just to, whatever, God, whatever you want to take, just take it. Take it. I want to ask you, is there anything you hold back from God? If God came and asked you, if God worked in your heart about giving something, how would you feel about just living a life of open hands? Listen, he wants a life of sacrifice. Giving yourself for him. We see good uh, examples of this. Turn over, we're going to look at uh, one, look at uh, Mark chapter 12. We see this widow with two mites. In Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast in money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow. And she threw in two mites, which made a farthing. farthing. And he called unto him, uh, unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more 
that cast more in than all they which they cast into the treasury. For all they did cast into their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had. Look at even all her living. She gave it all. Why? Out of a love for God. She gave it all. Listen, hold nothing back. You know, you, you, you'll be better off and you'll be a happier person. You'll have more joy in your life if you just, just let God do whatever he wants to with your life. Amen. Much love, much sacrifice. The woman with the alabaster box. You don't have to turn that, but listen. Matthew 26, verses 6 through 12. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as, as he sat at me. But when his disciples saw they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor always with you. But me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Listen, other people looked at that looked at that woman and said, look at this. Look at this waste. <laughs> wasting, wasting his own Christ. Is that what they're saying? But you know what? The world will look at you and they'll look at sacrifices you make for God and they'll say, why are you wasting your life like this? Why would you do that? Why would you give away all this money to the church and missions and so forth? Why would you do that? But you know what Christ looks at and he says, it's not a waste. It's, 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 it's out of love for me. Notice, notice he did that to that woman there that gave the ointment, but then that widow who cast in those two mites, he went and he told his disciples, listen, she's given everything for me. What a blessing that is. I want you to know that Christ takes notice of the sacrifice that you give. And, and, and I want you also to know this, you cannot outgive God. That's right. If you sacrifice your life from him, for him, you give yourself for him. He will bless you more than you can ever know. So, as we close today, you see the ringing of the temple bell has significance for you and me. Without it, we'd still be separated from God, performing sacrifices and getting priests to represent us to God. And I'm thankful that the way has been opened up for us to have a personal relationship with him. Now, Maybe you hadn't thought much about your personal relationship with the Lord. I want to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? I mean, I, I know that I get up here and I get excited about being saved, but listen. Do you know him? Are you saved? If you died today, do you know where you'd go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Maybe you don't know. If you don't know... Why don't during this invitation, why don't you come forward? I'd be glad to take this Bible and show you how you can know. Listen, we all need to consider. Those of us who are saved, we need to consider our relationship with God and how much it means to Him. It means so much that He died for it. And so we need to start living like the veil's been rent and that we have a great relationship with Him. Let's pray. Father,